She placed the robe and the threadbare rebox over on the couch for Brandy to put on. The shoes would be worthless out in the snow, but around the house they would keep her feet warm, if she could wear them. Kayana did have big feet. Kayana's jeans were stiff and totally dry, and so was her heavy shirt. It was so good to be dressed again, and it gave her new energy to have on some clothes. She squirmed around in her things now, to break loose that stiff, dry feeling. Soon she had her clothes broken in again, and was comfortable. She decided that she was not jealous of Brandy. If she had been jealous of Brandy, she would not have treated her so well. She treated Brandy as if she was a daughter. Kelly would be proud of that, she had to think. So I can't be too jealous of her then, can I? she asked herself. Kayana readied her robe for Brandy, and it was about to take it into her when the door opened. Brandy stepped out of the bathroom, bringing Kayana all of her bottles and her soap. Brandy was shaking her long brown hair back with her free hand, and she was still moaning a little bit. Brandy glowed with a new fire. Her eyes danced, and her pupils dilated with delight. God, I feel good, she exclaimed as she handed Kayana her things. With a practiced grace, she leaned forward and kissed Kayana gently. Kayana felt a surge go through her, and Brandy laughed. Her laughter was the sound of water as it races over stones. You asked me, began Brandy, demurring slightly, if I like to be touched, remember? Kayana remembered and nodded. Brandy reached out, and still wearing her bathrobe, hugged Kayana hard, squeezing her against the drying terry cloth. Thank you, she whispered into Kayana's ear. Kayana felt a little bit numb as she handed Brandy her old blue robe. Brandy whipped off the towel to reveal her flawless, malnourished body, and Kayana was as shocked as she could be to find that Brandy still looked like a model. But then, as Kayana knew full well, most actresses and models did live on starvation diets and still looked terrific. Brandy's weight loss had made her look like a teenager again and made Kayana look older than Brandy, rather than the other way around. That was fine with Kayana. She was beginning to groove on this maternal idea she had for Brandy. It made Kayana feel needed and vital, and it gave her strength to continue. That was important to her, because it made this captor seem less of a threat to them. Kayana reached out and ran her fingers through Brandy's hair, shaking out the water as best as she could. Towel your head dry, Brandy, said Kayana motherly. I don't want you to get a chill out here. As if by design, Brandy sneezed for Kayana at just that moment. See, asked Kayana, and felt Brandy nod her head under the towel. Kayana whipped out her hot blow dryer, plugged it in, and blew Brandy totally dry in about three minutes. She cleaned all that oil out of her head, and her hair had come to stunning life as it dried. Kayana got out her combs and brushes and played for a while as Brandy sat on the couch, eyes closed, enjoying the treatment. The fine mists of Brandy's thick hair fell over Kayana's arms in long, wild strands. Kayana combed and brushed and played, unaware of the soothing and very hypnotic effect this act was having on both of them. Thanks for the robe, said Brandy, rubbing her hands over the old terry cloth as if it were an expensive garment. Compared to that blanket, Kayana thought, it must feel precious indeed. You can have it, said Kayana, still combing Brandy's hair. Brandy smiled up at her, and then allowed herself to be groomed some more. You know, said Brandy, I have no idea where he's got my things. Kayana didn't say anything, she was thinking. But you know what I miss most of all? Kayana looked down at her, staring at the top of her head. What? she asked the actress. I miss my underpants, whispered Brandy. Kayana felt herself just a little. Brandy missed her panties most of all. Kayana hadn't even thought of it, but yes, perhaps that would be a terrible thing for a woman to have to deal with. No underpants for a year. How vulnerable would that make a woman feel? How terribly vulnerable. Kayana stopped combing her hair and stepped back from her. Brandy didn't turn around. 
Where do you think they are? asked Kaina, moving behind her. I have no idea, said Brandy, finger combing the long roots of her hair, but I sure wish I did. I hate feeling so naked. And my hair, God, it's a disaster. It hasn't been cut in so long that... But she did not get the rest of it out. She had turned to show Kaina her hair and how poorly it looked since it had not been cut, and she froze silently in exclamation. Brandy's eyes grew wide and her mouth fell open. Kaina smiled and laid her blue jeans across the couch. I'm listening, said Kaina, bending over to remove her underpants. Keep talking. Kaina stood now, naked from the waist down. She handed Brandy her underpants as calmly as if she was handing her a handkerchief. Brandy accepted the black silk underwear and rubbed her fingers helplessly against the liquid fabric. They were as soft as they could be between her hands. Brandy started to cry. She was trying to talk, but she couldn't. It was as if all of her feelings had come back to life in that shower and were now exposed and open to the light, given to coming out at any strange moment. Kayana smiled and wiped away a falling tear from under Brandy's eye. Shush now, said Kayana, and put them on. As Kayana zipped her coarse jeans back up around her own bottom, she watched Brandy slide into Kayana's underpants. Brandy squirmed into them and rubbed her hands all over her buttocks and over the stretched fabric of the garment. She smiled and cried some more and wiped her eyes self-consciously. I'm sorry, said Brandy. I just can't help it. She looked at Kayana really hard for a moment. You really mean to rescue me, don't you? Kayana nodded and stood silently before her, hair dryer in hand. I didn't believe you before, said Brandy, especially when you said he was just gone and not dead. I didn't believe you could do it. Kayana swallowed and listened as she continued. But now, Kayana, I want you to know. Brandy rubbed her hands over her own thighs, protectively, subconsciously. I want you to know whether you get me out of here or not. I believe that you can do it. Kayana was struck silent by this act of faith. I really think you can, Kayana. Kayana turned and swallowed the tightness in her own throat, putting her things back into her bags and zipping them tightly. And when she was able to speak again, she put her things back under the couch and turned to Brandy again. Brandy was staring at her, almost in adulation. It was as if Kayana was now the famous actress and Brandy the star-struck fan. Kayana couldn't help noticing the hair on Brandy's legs. It was itching her now that she was clean, and Brandy was scratching at it. They embraced for a moment and sat down together on the couch for a while. They didn't say anything. They just held one another closely. This gave them support, and after a while, they slumped together, tired and fatigued. Brandy's head slipped down into Kayana's lap, and there it remained. From time to time, Kayana would caress her hair and hum a little bit to her. She was humming an old slave song from a movie she remembered about letting people go. Brandy adjusted herself a little in Kayana's lap and did a very sweet thing, Kayana would recall later. Brandy went to sleep on her lap, a sure sign that she trusted her. Trusted her enough not only to come out of the room upstairs and stay out of that room, but now to sleep outside of the room. Irregardless of himself, the hated captor, Brandy was now outside the room. Now, thought Kayina, to get her out of the house, to get us both out of here, that was going to be the difficult part. She sat and tried to think of her next plan of action, now that she had won little Miss Manson over to her side and away from the captor. She was thinking, but her thoughts began to muddy as it grew evening in the room around her. She felt time wipe softly across her face, lulling her under like it was an old gray quilt. Somewhere a clock ticked, and for the first time since she'd been here in the house, she noticed it. But it was too late. Her last conscious thought was the great knife lying beside her on the old battered couch, pointing away from the two girls. The sun was just going down as she too slumped against Brandy, 
her chin resting on the girl's ear. Kaina faded off to sleep herself. For a few blessed hours, Kaina had escaped the room and the threat of the captor and dreamed of Kelly and home again. Nothing made any noise at all while they slept in the growing darkness. Echo was watching television in her own apartment. She was lying on her stomach in the floor in front of the TV set. Her mom would have said she was too close to the screen and would have made her move back. But her mom was on the phone in the other room right now. She was too busy to mess with Echo, and Echo lay, enjoying the sound of her mother's anger, vented upon someone else, someone on the phone. In fact, if that person had been anyone else but her father, Echo would have enjoyed it very much. As Mr. Ed was speaking from the television, Echo imagined her mother's voice coming out of his big mouth. Straight from the horse's mouth, boy, and don't you forget it either. No, sir, you take her off to God knows where and do God knows what without even consulting me first. Echo shook her head slowly. Bitch. I did not say that you could take her to the Scorpions concert. You approved that on your own. You know how I feel about that, Gregory. You know I have a hard enough time. Bitch, bitch, bitch. Bitch. You're the problem, Gregory, not me. We get on fine as long as you haven't been interfering. Echo was glad her father was interrupting her every few seconds. The lies that woman could tell made her sick to her stomach. Echo felt her empty stomach roiling within her. No, I swear, Greg, no, that never happened. Echo sighed and went over to turn Mr. Ed up to drown Mother out. They were getting ready to discuss how he had fondled her in the bathtub as an infant. And if she had to hear about that once more, she was going to scream. Echo had already decided in her heart that even if her father had molested her in the tub as a baby, it wasn't nearly as bad as having to live with mother now. She didn't remember being injured as a child, and she certainly had no marks on her to prove any abuse. Except what mother had done to her lately in the name of punishment. Echo had already figured out what it was that Mother was punishing her for, too. She was punishing Echo for growing up, for biologically leaving Brenda to grow old and alone. Echo changed the channel to CNN. The voices were deeper on this channel and would be able to compete better with Mother's complaining and bitching and arguing. Officials in Jefferson County have no idea where the girl is. Echo was only half listening, another sex murder most likely. Echo was now reading about the deliberate stranger, and now it seemed that they were finding more of these victims every day. Echo wondered who this girl was that they were talking about. This is Madras, Oregon, said a man's voice, and Echo's ears shot up. Oregon, huh? Kayina was in Oregon, wasn't she? Echo wondered if she knew about this missing girl or not. Was Madras anywhere near the place Kayina was to be staying? What was it? Ashley? Ashton? Ashwood? Yeah, that was it. Ashwood. Ashwood, Oregon. The snow behind the man was insanely deep. It looked about twenty feet deep in places. Echo felt herself swallowing hard despite herself. Fear welled up within her for her friend. The call, placed a week ago, listed Kayina Shea Erbicum as missing from Ashwood, where she was to have gone to stay with her mother. Echo felt her face flush over and her ears ring loudly. No, please, no, not Kayina, no. It can't be Kayina, God, no. Now it all came home to little Echo. She had been so worried that Kelly was going to call Brenda over her staying in their apartment that she had not even really worried about Kayina being unaccounted for at all. When Kelly said that Kayina was late, this wasn't really all that big a deal. When the man on national television said Kayana was missing, it had become true. It had become a very big deal. Kayana was really gone. Gone. Echo made a noise in her throat and wanted to cry and scream aloud, but the years of living with Brenda did not permit such outbursts. Echo held her tongue and felt the hot heat of helplessness surround her and choke her down. Kayana was missing. They would have to find her. They just had to. Echo was crying when she heard a noise behind her. She rolled over and saw her mother standing in the doorway, 
listening as the man droned on and on about Kaina and where she had last been seen and how she had come to be lost and oh my god Echo felt this final realization slam her as her mother stared through her pure hatred in her eyes the secret was out mama knew Kaina was gone mama said Echo weakly from the floor but her mother turned around and walked silently out of the room, back towards her bedroom. Echo got up and felt like the weight of the world had crashed down upon her. Kayana gone, and now her mother knew she'd been lying to her. Echo wanted to die. Her mother was sitting on her own bed, staring down at the floor. Her color was not good at all. Her eyes had turned the color of frozen meat. She seemed to be almost catatonic as she gripped her hands tightly on her lap. She did not notice Echo enter the room. Echo walked over and sat down beside her mother on the bed, putting her arm around her. I'm sorry, Mama, please, began little Echo. Her mother was shaking her head slowly back and forth. I don't know, she said eerily. I just don't know. Echo listened. I tried to raise her better, I did. I told her not to lie to me, ever. I said that liars went to hell, didn't I? She looked right at Echo, still talking about Echo in the third person. Echo shivered eerily. I did say that, didn't I? Didn't I tell her that? I told Echo not to lie to me. Didn't I say that? Echo nodded numbly. And yet she lied and lied and never did get out of it. I'm sorry for what happened to her. Echo froze. Not only was her mother talking to her in the third person, but now she was using the past tense. What are you saying, Mama? asked Echo. Her mother said nothing. She got up and walked over to the closet. Oh, shit, here it comes. She's going to whip me. She's going to hit me. But at that moment, Echo secretly hoped that was all she did. She could take that if Mama would just get that look out of her eyes. She could take any punishment so long as her mother never, ever looked at her like that again. Her mother disappeared into the closet, and there was the sound of tinkling coat hangers that usually preceded a belting. Echo didn't know whether to assume the position yet or just wait. She sat, shivering like she had a fever. Sweat broke out on her forehead in bullet-sized drops. Mama was spending way too much time in that closet. Echo felt nauseous. She turned around and put her hands on the bed, assuming the position. Run. That thought came into her head like a bolt of electric energy. It made her head hurt. Now I've got to take this. She'll get over it. She will. She... Echo turned around and looked over her shoulder. Her mother wasn't coming out of the closet, even though the tinkling of coat hangers had stopped. Mama? asked Echo weakly. Nothing. Run. She swallowed and started to cry. Mama, I'm sorry, she yelled out. Just get it over with. She looked back and terrified, saw the closet. No sound came out of it. Still, her mother did not appear. Please, Mama, just get it over with. Then came a sound. It was the sound of a heavy lamp being moved across the top storage shelf. Echo screamed, but she did not know why. The door moved and her mother came outside again. She saw the look on her mother's face and snatched her hands off the bed, turning to face her. She wished now that she had run when she'd had the chance. Mama, screamed Echo. Please, Mama, no, I, God, no. A long brown cord slipped out of the jumble in her mother's hand, and Echo saw that it was attached to something unspeakable. Echo screamed, and the last thing she recalled seeing was the fierce white-hot grip her mother had on the jumbled mass of electrical cord. It was a quarter of seven when Mrs. Cherbourg heard the ambulance pull up out front, its lights swirling and blinking garishly. Mrs. Cherbourg figured that it was coming for old lady Tasco over in D. She was nearly dead anyway, and if they were here for her, it wouldn't shock her. Mrs. Cherbourg would feel saddened, but she knew that it was best. Sadie had wanted to die now for a very long... Mrs. Cherbourg's thoughts were stopped in mid-flow. The ambulance was pulled up in front of Echo's place. 
Shades of Angie Markham came back to the elderly lady now, like a very old terror. Her hand was on her mouth. Oh, no. The stretcher was unloaded and whisked into 12B. Brenda Bradley was nowhere to be seen. Mrs. Cherborg watched as the police arrived, and for a long time no one came out of the housing unit at all. Then they finally did get the stretcher backed out of the door. They were not moving fast at all. Mrs. Cherborg felt her heart drop in her chest. Grabbing her scarf, she snatched her perch off the table and darted out of the door. For the first time in fifty years, she forgot to lock it behind her on her hurried way out. The door did not even close. It swung back open, hideously inviting anyone to enter. Anyone at all. Chapter 13 Brandy and Kayina passed that second night together downstairs on the old couch. Neither of them moved much before dawn, and they both woke up stiff and well-rested. It was the most sleep Kayina had had in several days, and since her shower, Brandy Manson was feeling like a new woman all the way around. It was nearly seven in the morning by Kayina's watch. Brandy was up first, and she was smiling sweetly at Kayina as Kayina found a way to open her eyes and wake up. For a moment, Kayina was confused. She thought Brandy was Echo. She thought they were back in the apartment and that they had been asleep on the living room couch, like Echo and Kayina sometimes did. Kayina feared that Kelly would be mad at them because they had not properly gotten up to go to bed last night. Her mom had this thing for little girls getting to a proper bed before falling asleep. Sleeping in the floor or on the couch like this was a big no-no, as big a no-no as spotting a set of waterbed sheets with her period. Mama didn't like that at all. Kayana jumped up, startled, hoping that Kelly had not seen them. Reality settled back in just about the time Brandy was explaining to, explaining to her that he wasn't here yet and to chill out. Kayana started to explain the real reason she had startled herself when she decided against it. It seemed stupid to Kayana now to be afraid of Kelly ever again. They had more important things to fear now besides her mother. Today would be bright, Kayana noticed, bright and cold. The room wasn't cold, and with a smile, Kayana saw that Brandy could make instant fire in the old Fisher stove. Brandy had gotten good at making fires. You learn damn quick, Brandy was saying, when it means you might go cold. Today, Kayana saw that Brandy would be useful in their fight against this madman. She did have a take-charge attitude once Kayana had resurrected it within Brandy's stoned memory. Brandy was scurrying about now, picking up things and busying herself as though they were expecting company today. They were. But Kayana didn't think of that so much anymore. She had feared his return for three days now, and still he had not come. While she didn't want to forget he might pop in at any moment, she found it hard to raise herself to Brandy's level of preparedness. Kayina was mentally tapped out, for one thing. She was more concerned with him leaving here rather than his coming back. She knew that the best way to take him on was to not to have to take him on at all and be a long ways gone when he did get back. That would be best. Today they must find Brandy's clothes, thought Kayina and they must see if there is a phone anywhere to be had. Surely he has one hidden here somewhere. Brandy, still in Kayana's robe, didn't look ready to travel anywhere. Finding her clothes would take top priority today. The old shoes she was wearing wouldn't keep her feet dry until they got off the porch. These old Reeboks ought to have been tossed long ago, but they did make nice house slippers. Terrific. Brandy's dressed to stay here, and we have to go now. Brandy smiled at Kayina and read her mind perfectly. You missed Echo when you woke up just now, didn't you? asked Brandy, poking more wood into the great Fisher stove. Kayina cocked her head. How did you know that? asked Kayina. Brandy shrugged and said softly, Doesn't matter. I was right, wasn't I? She was, and she knew it, too. Kayana nodded. 
I'm jealous of her, said Brandy, laying her feelings out in front of Kaina as boldly as she dared. Why, asked Kaina, thoroughly mystified. Because she has a friend like you. This touched Kaina deeply. Here, all along, Kaina and Echo had been thinking of how special it would have been to have been Bam Bam Manson, and as it turns out, Brandy was jealous of their friendship. Kaina smiled and said nothing. There was nothing to say. Kaina felt suddenly bad about ever having hated Brandy. When you get me out of here, Brandy was saying, I'll have to go back into my world again, back to being a star. You'll get to go back to Echo and be with her. Brandy looked up at Kaina and said, I'm going to lose you, Kaina. Kaina was speechless for a moment. Brandy was going to miss her. Kaina thought about Echo and bit back tears, tears she didn't want to have to explain to Brandy just then. But she would explain them to Echo if ever again she saw her. Don't worry about that, Brandy, said Kaina, reaching out to touch Brandy's arm. I'm not like you, girl. I live a private life, and you can call me any time you like. I'll always take your calls. In reply to this, Brandy brightened up. She had not thought about that. Kaina would have a difficult time trying to get to her, but Brandy was free to get her call through to Kaina any time she wanted to pick up the phone. Kaina's mother had a listed number. Suddenly, Kaina thought that Brandy was a little bit jealous of Kaina's private life and the freedom she enjoyed. Kaina was right. She was. This made Kaina feel very nice. Kaina could sense adulation coming from Brandy Manson, and she was reveling in its glow. A stunned look would have crossed Little Echo's face if she could have seen her idol worshipping Kaina. Oh, what a look Little Echo would have made over that. Echo would have been very proud of Kaina. Kaina stared at the wall as Brandy moved about the room, occasionally st singing and doing little dance steps. Kaina could tell that she was becoming happy in her own way, and with that, she knew no captor could defeat them, ever. Kaina also realized that she no longer needed Kelly like she had thought she would need her. Kaina had developed at last, and it felt good. It felt nice to be grown up now. There wasn't as much pressure on her. What are we going to do now? asked Brandy, like a little girl would have asked her mother. Kaina smiled and asked her if she was hungry. You bet, she said. Well, we eat first, and then we look for a phone, said Kaina, upbeat and now ready to meet the challenges of the day. And then we find you your clothes and see about getting out of here. Brandy nodded vigorously up and down. She was all for that. With her new heroine, Brandy felt like she, too, could do anything at all. They ate their same breakfast fare, and they talked about getting out of that old house like a couple of female convicts preparing for a prison break. For some reason, the day didn't seem as threatening as the other days had been. Kaina's mood was up, and Brandy was following after her like a schoolgirl with a crush on a new teacher. It would have been cute to an outsider to have watched the two of them together. Brandy was giving Kaina something that Echo, Mrs. Cherbourg, and Kelly all together could not give her. She was giving her undivided attention. To Brandy, who had finally realized that Kaina was her rescuer, there was no greater in the world than Kaina Erbicum. Brandy was in love with her. Brandy would have, in that moment, given her very life to Kaina. She would do for Kaina what she didn't in any way have enough nerve to do for herself. She would, for Kaina, thwart the wishes of the captor. She would stand against him, for her, for Kaina if it came to that. Kaina was positively basking in the adulation. You can come and see me any time, Brandy, Kaina was saying as they cleaned up their mess. Despite the fact that they were in such a bad house, Kaina was actually cleaning up the mess. This so blew Brandy away that she commented on it. We are not like him, Brandy, said Kaina. We are ladies, and we don't make a mess and leave it. My mama taught me better. You don't do it for him, you do it for yourself. The food was free and good. Show your appreciation, Brandy. 
It was crazy to Brandy, risking getting caught, just to make sure the place was clean. She said as much. Well, said Kaina, if he had come in on us in the kitchen, we were armed to the teeth, were we not? Brandy agreed that they had been surrounded by knives. And now if he comes home, there's no trace that we were ever in there, unless he comes upstairs, right? Brandy had to agree with that as well. So, said Kaina, out of breath at the top of the stairs, what are we out of by doing that? Nothing, admitted Brandy, which only served to make her think even more of her new friend. Kaina was carrying the long knife, and Brandy felt very safe beside her. Let's split up, said Kaina, handing her a smaller butcher knife she had found in a drawer. Brandy took it like it was made of pure gold, and she held it out awkwardly. I want to check these back bedrooms, and you look in all the drawers and closets and stuff, just to see what's back here. Brandy did not question her orders, and went straight to work in the first of the bedrooms, the one where Kaina had slept the first night. The bed was made up loosely, and Brandy smiled, thinking that Kaina had slept here. That was the bed his mother had died in, and she wondered if Kaina knew about that. Now best not to tell her, or it might upset her. Yeah, don't say anything. Then she thought, saw her blanket. Brandy had brought her blanket back upstairs early this morning, and had folded it up, lying on the couch. It looked very filthy and very old now. I better hide this first, she smiled to Kaina, who nodded in kind. I don't need him seeing me out of this. Kaina shook her head, and she went back into the back bedroom, where the captor would sleep. She went over to the closet, and began to meander through the back area. It wasn't very dusty back in there, but there was a large box she felt with her hands. Kayana spent a good five minutes trying to unearth this thing from the back wall. A great cardboard thing it was, with a loose lid flapped over the top hasp, and a small stick driven through the holes to secure it. Kayana finally got it out of the back area and managed to get the lid off. Her eyes lit right up. Brandy, she yelled. Brandy, come here. Bingo. First closet she checked, and there they were. Brandy's clothing, all in one box and all in perfect condition. Kayina was batting a thousand today. Brandy, she called. Brandy appeared in the doorway. Kayina jumped to her feet and spun around to the startled girl. In her hands, she held up a camel ski jacket, green, white, and blue in color. Brandy's eyes lit up as brightly as Kayina's had. Kayina had all but Brandy's shoes now. You found them, she exclaimed, and rushed to take them from her. Yes, they were hers. For an instant, Kayana wasn't sure, because Brandy stared at them like she didn't recognize them. If this wasn't Brandy's jacket, then whose was it? Kayana didn't want to answer that question, thinking of freezers and other places to hide the parts of other young women. She was very glad when Brandy took delivery and accepted these as her own garments. So very, very glad. Brandy dug out her old yellow and black high-top rebox from the box and kicked Kayana's old ones off like so much newspaper. Kayana was happy to see her with her own things again. She picked up her old rebox, the paper-thin, sold ones, and she tossed them back into the captor's clothing box. For you, she smiled, and she slammed the lid again. Brandy gathered up her clothes and started out the door. Where are you going? asked Kayana, a little confused. But as Brandy turned to her, Kayana could see that there was something wrong. I want to be alone for a little while, said Brandy. Is that all right? <laughs> said Kayana, making a noise like Echo would have, or even Kelly. Of course, darling. You take all the time you need. Brandy smiled, and her confidence was gone now. Kayana felt a chill in the room. Brandy walked quickly away from Kayina. Don't rush her, said Kayina to herself. She's done so very well today, a minute one way or the other won't make any difference. Let her have her rituals or whatever. Give her that moment of silence. For remember, she's a sensitive artist. Sure. A lot of bullshit, maybe. But she was an artist. Of sorts. Kayina went back to searching around the rooms for lots of things, and found nothing new. All the rooms on that end held no special surprises at all, and it was getting boring now, digging through empty drawers and things. 
She couldn't help but think of Brandy, who had been back in her old room now for about five minutes. A feeling like she ought to go and check up on her came over Kayina, but she delayed it. She did not want to crowd Brandy. She didn't know that Brandy might be going through strange things right now, and she didn't want to bother her if she was. Her clothing had brought back some powerful memories, memories of the last day she had worn them, memories of her abduction. Strange, but the things that should give people their most comfort, their own clothing, might make people recall their most horrible memories. Kayana swallowed. Her throat was hurting. Kayana would have to give her some more time. Now that she had found something else in the closet that was in the mother's old bedroom, it was hidden in the folds of some plastic back down in the closet, like a secret vice. Kayana had found something really neat. It was a bottle of blackberry brandy, and it was sticking out of an entire case of the stuff. Elderberry Farms, it said on the side of it. Kayana had drunk this once before at a party, and she had loved it. Realizing she hadn't had a drink in days, she opened one of the bottles and tasted their maroon-colored liquid. It burned a little bit, and it tasted medicine-like. Kayana smiled deeply, and she turned the bottle up, getting a great swallow of the stuff. Her sore throat felt a lot better, really fast now. To Echo, she said, who first introduced me to this stuff back home. She put the bottle to her lips again and drank. Her fears were being burnt out of her now, and Kayana felt a lot better with each sip. She smiled after several more tastes of the rich liquid. Then she thought of Brandy. Brandy! Of course! Give Brandy some of herself. Some brandy wine. Kayana picked out another bottle and started carrying them both out of the room. She knew somehow that Brandy was back in that old captive room and would most likely be standing there in her robe, staring at the pile of clothes Kayina had given her. The jacket, the shoes, the jeans, and the shirt. The sweater with the deer on it, and the nice white panties would be there, too. Kayina thought that now she could get her own back. She had to admit that it did feel funny walking around without her panties on. It rubbed her the wrong way. It would be right up Echo's alley, maybe, but not Kayina's. She didn't feel dressed without her underpants on. She wanted her own back. Brandy, said Kayina, entering the old room, I got us some liquid courage that'll be sure and... She stopped dead in her tracks. She was not prepared for what she saw. Kayana saw Brandy standing there naked. She'd slipped off Kayana's things, and her robe and underwear were separate from Brandy's clothing but she wasn't a bit closer to dressing herself than she had been ten minutes ago. Kayana took a large sip of her wine and wiped her mouth off with the back of her hand, with all the finesse of a farm hand. She eyed Brandy sternly. What gives? she asked the frightened girl. Why aren't you getting dressed? Brandy had no answer for her. She just stood there looking at Kayana holding two bottles of brandy like a gunslinger. Brandy trembled, for she knew that she had riled Kayana's anger. Brandy, I asked you a question. Kayana's eyes blurred a little bit from her encounter with the alcohol, but she stared hard at the recalcitrant girl before her. Something had happened with those damned clothes. Here she was doing so well, and then she had seen something that had reminded her of the attack. It was back to Captivity Cave once again. Well, thought Kayina, this is bullshit. She sucked her teeth and stood there, thinking of how to handle this. The wine made her braver. She had a good mind to give Brandy what for, but she held her peace for the moment. Brandy didn't look her in the eye. Kayina moved around to face her. You having second thoughts? asked Kayina, touching Brandy under her chin and raising her head so she could look at her. Brandy shook away angrily. Hey, said Kayana, it's just you and me, Brandy. What happened? Brandy bit her lower lip. Brandy, said Kayana, gaining that flat edge to her voice again. If this was the way she wanted it, if she was looking for Kayana to make her help herself, well, she had picked the right girl to mess with. Kayana grabbed Brandy by her shoulders and turned her towards herself so that Brandy was facing her. 
Brandy seemed small now, without any clothes on. She seemed so underweight. It scared Kaina a little bit to look at her like this. Listen, shouted Kaina angrily, the smell of brandy coming off Kaina like jet fuel. Kaina looked down at the floor where she dropped the two bottles of brandy and saw that the opened one, the one she had been drinking from, was pouring out red blood-like all over the hardwood floor, draining into the great cracks and most likely seeping down through the ceiling of the dining room. Kayana felt her face fuzz over a little bit, and she felt angry at having lost a full bottle of brandy like that. Funny, but she hadn't even heard it hit the floor. In fact, she hadn't even recalled dropping it. See, yelled Kayana, though she didn't know why. It wasn't Brandy's fault she'd spilled the wine. Brandy sniffed, and Kayana could see that she was crying. It made Kayana angry to see her cry. Brandy cried way too much. A girl should cry, but not too much. Crying loses its therapeutic effect when girls cry too much. Damn it, Brandy. This isn't going to be easy. Get a grip. Do something for yourself. Brandy sobbed still, not attempting to speak. Is it really worth living in this room under lock and key, Brandy? Kaina was yelling at her. Just to be safe from him? Brandy nodded up and down. Kaina went ballistic. You let me think that you were on my side. You said that I could do this. You said I could get you out of here. Brandy did not deny any of this. Brandy, yelled Kayana, get dressed. Now. Brandy looked up at her tearfully, but made no move to get dressed. Her resolve to help Kayana had totally deflated, and she was powerless. Brandy, I'm warning you, move. Brandy, in her lack of movement, defied Kayana. It was the greatest act of defiance that Kayana had seen her do yet, and Kayana had just enough liquor in her to really take offense. Kayana, at this point, had two choices. She could release the left arm of Brandy Manson and leave the room, or she could enforce her will upon the captive girl. She could show her that she was the new captor, or she would have to withdraw and leave her up here to cry alone, naked, forever. Kayana couldn't do that. Kelly's little parting speech came back to her, and all that stuff about mothers and daughters. Brandy had accepted Kayina as a mother figure, but a daughter always takes on her mother, doesn't she? Yes, and a mother, a good one, handles the situation. Brandy wasn't six years older than Kayina any longer. Nothing was as it should be, and Kayina was Brandy's only chance to get out of here. It would be Kayina's fault if she didn't even try. She decided to try. Brandy felt Kayana spin away from her so that Brandy's left shoulder was in front of Kayana's face. Kayana still had a death grip on Brandy's left arm, and she was still staring at her. A resolve had come over Kayana's features. She raised her right arm high, level with her own shoulder. Her palm was flat, and her fingers stiff and straight. Brandy was just about aware of what was going to happen when it took place. Kayana's arm fell swiftly, and Brandy felt a stinging slap right on her ass. The stinging heat of the blow echoed around the empty room like a gunshot, cracking off the walls. Brandy howled. Kayana raised her arm again, and Brandy squirmed for release, but it did no good. She might as well have tried to squirm away from a set of handcuffs. Brandy closed her eyes and hissed as Kayana's palm fell against her butt again. Again, the same loud report echoed off the walls, and Brandy yelped in pain. Kayana was possessed. Her eyes were fixed and glazed. Brandy started talking just before the third blow fell. She begged Kayana to stop. Her backside was stinging furiously, and Brandy suddenly wanted very much to put some clothes on. Brandy had no strength to stop her. This girl who was bent on beating her ass with the palm of her hand. Kayana stood up and released Brandy's arm. Sobbing deeply, Brandy fell over on the floor near the puddle of brandy wine. Kayana took a deep breath, tears in her throat, as she spun around, leaving the room in a whirl of anger and frustration. The air crackled around her as she left. Silly little bitch, thought Kayana. Lay up here and rot for all I care. I'm not your mother and I don't want to be either. Kayana had failed. She had done everything she could, 
think of to make Brandy see that she had to escape or die up here. She had done everything, even spanking her when she could no longer take the frustration. Kaina was not going to let Brandy get her killed, or worse, held captive by this freak. Kaina would not be in here when he came. She had her clothes now, Dammer. If she could remember how to put them on, then she could leave too. I've done all I could do, she sniffed. Kaina was leaving this house, snow or no snow, and right now. She had to admit that she didn't like spanking anyone. It made her feel bad, like Kelly used to say it made her feel bad when she spanked Kaina. It made her feel very bad. This is going to hurt me more than it is you, Pumpkin. That was true, and only now did Kaina just see how true it was. It had hurt Kaina worse than Brandy, whose bottom had been streaked with palm prints when she had slumped to the floor. Kaina had seen them when she watched her fall. They looked painful, Kaina swallowed, remembering. Kaina went into the captor's mother's room, the first one, and she got out a third bottle of brandy and a fourth to carry with her. If she froze to death out there in all that snow, well, at least she would die warm. She knew that the alcohol wouldn't make her any warmer. She would just feel warmer. Right now, to Kaina, that was the same thing. She opened the third bottle, and she was swigging it when she saw something going across the baseboard. It was black and long and cord-like. Kaina gasped and almost spilled her swallow of brandy. She walked carefully over to that end of the room and looked behind the old desk. There it was again. It meandered along the wall, tacked into place at points, and winding all along under the bed, out of sight. It was a phone cord. She followed it to an old dresser where it disappeared. Now wait a damn minute, thought Kaina. She went over and tried to peek behind the old dresser, but it was too dark. She got up and went over to the other side of the dresser, near the doorway that went into the second bedroom. She saw that the cord didn't surface on this side at all. She thought she'd take the lower of the drawers out and see what the story was behind there. Brilliant idea, Kaina. As she opened the lowest drawer, she got a surprise. There, in the drawer, was the phone. It was black and heavy, and it had a dial on it. Kayana had never seen a dial on a phone before, and as she reached out to get it, she noticed that her right hand was still stinging from Brandy's behind. She shook her fingers a little bit to make the swelling go down. She reached into the drawer, and she pulled the phone out. She placed the phone on her lap, and hoping against hope, she picked up the receiver. She held it up to her head, and she placed it against her ear. To her great and total surprise, she heard a dial tone. Wah. Her eyes closed in gratitude. Thank you, God. Oh, thank you. It was the most beautiful sound she'd ever heard in her life. She tried to resurrect her mother's phone number from her head, but it wouldn't come to her. To make matters worse, her home phone number was now jumbled up with echoes. She giggled a little bit. All her phone numbers were fornicating in her head right now. All her precious numbers had mutated and metastasized together. She had not one complete working phone number at all in her head right now. She dialed O. It took forever for the heavy dial to make its completed chunk, 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 chunk return. An operator picked up the line and said, Operator. Kayana told her she needed the police and that it was an emergency. The operator fired her into the 911 number system for Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. There was a momentary lapse of dial tone and then a man's voice. 911, what is your emergency? Yes, said Kayana, trying to sound serious and officious. Yes, I'm calling from some farmhouse about seven miles. Calm down, lady, okay? Start over. Kayana was offended. She was calm. What the hell did he want? She might have had a little drink, but damn it, she wasn't slurred yet. Kayana felt heat rise up in her face. You don't understand, officer, said Kayana. I'm in the house up here with Brandy Ann Manson. I have... Click.
click. Kayana stared at the phone, thoroughly pissed off at it. How dare he hang up on her? This was total bullshit. She'd have his job for this. He had most likely decided she was a crank and had hung up on her. Bastard. How do you like that? Man gets the most important call he'll ever have come over his 911 lines, and he hangs up on it. Kayana took a deep breath, and she looked at the dial card again, that circular wheel of numbers encompassing the antiquated dialing device. She was hunting for nine, to try 911 herself. She was doing this when a shadow fell over the wall in front of her. She looked up at the window, but the shadow was gone. Behind her stood Brandy. Kayana jumped and spun around to look at her. A strange feeling came over Kayana when she saw her. A strange feeling of shame and guilt. Brandy was fully dressed. Brandy looked thirty years old fully dressed in her expensive clothing. The change was unreal. She stood looking down at Kayana, and then she smiled at her. I'm sorry, Kay, said Brandy. Brandy called her Kay. Kayana smiled at her and reached out to touch her fingers. Me too, Brandy, said Kayana. I hated doing that. Let's just forget it ever happened and, and never mention it again. Brandy nodded emphatically. I realized something lying there on the floor, said Brandy. I realized that there was more to me than that. But when I saw these clothes, it just... I don't know. I love you, Kayana, said Brandy. No one else would have done that for me. Kayana hadn't thought of that, and it made her feel better. That was true. No one else would have thought of spanking her butt. Only Kelly's daughter would have thought of that. Only Kayana would have known just how effective a good heart spanking could be. Kayana brightened up, thinking of a way to change the subject. The weight in her mind was heavy now, and the weight in her lap reminded her. She held the phone up and laughed in her best Charles Nelson Riley impersonation. Look what I got. Brandy squealed in delight and jumped down on the floor beside her. She put the receiver up to her ear and listened, open mouthed and eyes blinking. She heard nothing. Kayana said Brandy slowly. It's dead. Kayana snatched it back and listened herself. All she heard was cottony silence. Kayana's mouth began to slowly drop open. I thought he had hung up on me, said Kayana slowly. Must be the snow on the lines, offered Brandy, hopefully. But Kayana wasn't thinking about snow right now. She was thinking of the shadow she had seen just before Brandy had come into the room to startle her. She was thinking of that as she got up and looked out the window. Her hands were trembling. She looked out at the window and saw nothing. There was just the snow-covered world below them, and that was two stories down. There could have been no shadow falling over the window, not this high up. Kayana shook her head and slowly pulled the curtain closed. She looked at Brandy and tried to smile. Yes, said Kayana at last. It must have been the snow. But Kayana had not seen the ladder. By the time she'd gotten to the window, he had taken it down. He had seen too much smoke coming out of the chimneys, and he had figured that Brandy was somehow out of her room. He had taken the precaution of cutting the lines, just in case she might have made a phone call. The master of the house was finally home, and as he was to soon discover, he was now the master of two. The master of the lost and found. When the light came back on again, she rolled over and discovered that she was in bed. There were white figures moving around her. They all smelled antiseptic and professional. They were crisp and sharp. They had no smiles. They didn't come by very often, but when they did, they would wake her up. There were others here, too. Others that didn't work here. Others that didn't have uniforms. They were crying and walking out in the hall. They wore regular clothes and spoke to others who, like herself, were in beds lining the corridor. When Echo finally got her mind adjusted enough to remember who she was, she made the mistake of trying to sit up. A bright bolt of pain welded her head back to the pillow, and there it remained. 
She did try to regain her breathing, but that was as big a chore as keeping her mouth lubricated with saliva. She seemed awfully dry. She woke up again and was in a semi-private ward this time. It was quieter here than it had been out in the corridor. It was nicer, too. There was no one standing looking down at her like a corpse in a casket. Echo tried to rest, but after all that sleep, rest was not to be had. Brenda Bradley had been arrested. Echo wouldn't know this for some time, but she had been arrested and charged with abusing a minor in familial or custodial care. She should have been charged with attempted murder, according to the DA's office, but the prosecutor didn't go with that charge. He said it would have been too hard to prove or something. Echo's custody was uncertain now. The Division of Youth Services, along with a county judge and Brenda Bradley's attorney, were all after the young girl. DYS wanted to put her in a state home as soon as she was able. The judge was working with her father, Gregory Bradley, and his sordid past to see if they might get her released to him. And the attorney was trying to show Brenda as a taxed and put-upon adult mother of an errant child. Echo was spared all of that hot air. Hi, said a young girl from the doorway. She was about Echo's age. Mm, said Echo. She was startled to find her lip was swelled up to the size of a grapefruit. It was really the size of a grape, but with the sensitive blood vessels, it seemed to Echo to be just about the size of a grapefruit. The girl took Echo's hand in hers, and suddenly Echo felt very loved. It was weird, she would later recall, but just to have someone take your hand like that was the nicest thing that could happen to a patient. Any patient. The girl had squeezed Echo's fingers gently, and suddenly Echo wanted to cry. I brought you some water, Bonnie was saying, still rubbing Echo's fingers with her soft little hands. The doctor said you might get thirsty. Echo wanted to nod, but all she could do was make a positive sound in her injured little throat. Bonnie brought the water over and poured Echo a cup of it. She had a towel for some reason under the cup and she raised Echo's bed so that she would have a better angle of attack on the side of the cup. The cup was plastic, and the pitcher was yellow. Echo soon realized the towel and why it was under there like that. The water spilled out of the cup and down onto the towel. More of it went onto the towel than went into Echo's mouth. Echo felt the shame and embarrassment of the newly injured. Hot tears stole softly down her face and into the numb part of her lower jaw. Bonnie smiled like an angel and took out a tissue from a box to wipe Echo's tears with it. It's all right, she whispered to the injured girl. You cry if you want to, Echo. It will make you feel better. Echo. She had called her by her name. There was nothing threatening about Bonnie. That was the name on the candy striper outfit. She was as sweet as she could be. Normally, Echo felt threatened by kids her own age, but this one was like an adult in a kid's body. Echo liked her right away and wanted her to stay with her. I think that's a beautiful name, Bonnie was saying. Echo, I like that. Echo smiled, and it felt like her lip was caught in a ringer. She winced, and Bonnie placed a small cube of ice on her mouth, taking the pain out as if by magic. Your mouth was numb, Echo, Bonnie was saying. The doctors told me to tell you this, so you wouldn't be worried or anything. You're going to be fine. Echo believed her. She wanted to believe her. Bonnie was wiping loose strands of hair away from Echo's little face, and as she did so, Echo loved her. She was the gentlest creature Echo had ever known in her short life. Echo started to weep again. I have to make my rounds, said Bonnie, but I'll come back and sit with you later. Would you like that? Echo smiled, and it was taken as a yes answer. That's my girl, said Bonnie, squinching her nose up at Echo playfully. I want to be with you now, because you need someone, I think. I'll fill my other pictures and come back then. How's that? Echo blinked and watched her go. All the medicine in the world would not have done for Echo, nearly what that little bit of kindness had done for her. To be so touched by someone who cared, 
who genuinely cared, could there be anything in the world greater than that? It was enough for Echo, later, to make her want to go on living. Echo dozed, and in her dreams she was cold and afraid. Her dreams were a silver color, drug-colored dreams. Echo's life story was hideously woven into the patterns. This was worse than the hard effects of narcotics. A lot worse. When Echo surfaced again from the depths of her nightmares, she found herself washed up again on the same bed. She managed to steal a peek at the door so as not to let the light blind her eyes. She was surprised to find that the lights were dimmer now. It must be evening. Either that or she was going blind. She looked over at the windows, her head moving like a great stone would roll, slowly and with a great weight. It was evening outside, and she was relieved to note that her eyes were fine. But something moving over by the doorway again made her roll her head, her great, heavy, ponderously heavy head, back over to the door again. It was a lady in a purple dress. The lady had been crying, and Echo wondered why. Echo wanted to speak to the lady, to call her closer, so she could concentrate on who she was, but she couldn't speak well enough to try it. The lady moved inside the room all on her own, and saved Echo the trouble of doing anything. As the lady moved nearer, Echo saw that she knew her. Not only did she know her, but Echo was shocked that she had not recognized her right away. The lady was Mrs. Cherbourg. She looked awful. Her face was puffy from lack of sleep, and her eyes were red. She walked up to Echo as if she was afraid she might frighten the poor child. When she saw that Echo was unafraid of her, Mrs. Cherbourg smiled softly and drew even nearer still. Mrs. Cherbourg tried to remain calm as she looked at the child, lying there, her face a mass of purple bruises, and her poor little jaw swollen so much larger than it should have been. She placed her frail, papery fingers down on Echo's hand and smiled at her. It was evident to Deanna Cherbourg that her visit here was not amiss. Hi, said Mrs. Cherbourg. Ugh, managed Echo, a tear on her face from exertion. Mrs. Cherbourg looked around them and over Echo's head out the window. A quick glance outside to the parking lot and then finally back to the door again. How are you feeling, precious? asked Mrs. Cherbourg, and Echo knew she meant it. Since their sex talk, they were really close, and Echo would do anything for Mrs. Cherbourg. Hmm, managed Echo, rolling her eyes. Ouch, it hurt even to do that. Where's my mom? asked Echo, exerting herself. She's at the police station, said Mrs. Cherbourg, filling out papers. That wasn't a lie, really. She was filling out affidavits and arrest papers. That was paperwork, wasn't it? She was attempting to make a monstrous amount of bail set by the county judge. Does my dad know? asked Echo, straining to the point of pain. Her face bore the marks of fatigued sleep and physical upset. Mrs. Cherbourg couldn't help herself. She leaned over the bed and kissed Echo lightly on her forehead. Echo's eyes were bright when she pulled away. Yes, said Mrs. Cherbourg. He knows, and he's on his way, Princess. What Mrs. Cherbourg didn't tell Echo was her father was standing outside the doorway, waiting to talk with her. Mrs. Cherbourg would cut short her own visit with the child so her dad could see her. The doctors weren't going to let them tax little Echo too much, and Mrs. Cherbourg didn't want to even begin to tire the poor little thing out. Bonnie Sue, the candy striper, Gregory James Bradley were both standing outside the doorway, waiting to hear what Echo would say. The candy striper was very comforting. Gregory Bradley had signed some very important papers a few hours ago. If his daughter accepted the arrangement, it would be all right. If she didn't, then it would be the state house for her when she was discharged. Echo had wanted to live with her daddy since he'd been forced out of their home years ago by the divorce decree. That would not be possible, Gregory knew. No, little Echo would be looking at state time when she got out. No one wanted to be the proud parents of a 14-year-old girl. But as Gregory had discovered just this day, 
there were saints in the world after all. Gregory was not a crying man, but this day had seen him spill over several times out of sheer gratitude. He loved little Echo better than anyone in the world, and he would do anything he could for her. Echo, we have to talk, and I don't have long with you, dear, said Mrs. Cherbourg. But I need to ask you something. Are you all right to talk a minute? Echo nodded, and from the urgency in her voice, all thoughts of sleep vanished from her little mind. Mrs. Cherbourg was up to something. They are going to have to send you somewhere when you're discharged. They just won't let you live with your daddy, I'm sorry to say. Echo smiled at this. Mrs. Cherbourg also believed he was innocent, not because she believed it on her own, but because Echo believed it. Mrs. T believed what Echo believed. Now we have to get you a home, or the state will take you in. You don't want that, darling. Echo listened intently, not trying to speak. Now in order to be taken into a home without prior approval, the family must be blood relatives of yours. If anyone else takes you in, Echo, it takes about a year to clear them for custodial adoption. Echo felt her little world deflate. She had no other relatives. She would have to go to the state home, after all. Damn it. However, the judge in this case has issued adoption papers to a certain family, Echo. He has cleared them to take you in, because they have been on a waiting list for a long time. Now they are approved and ready to go. They were the only family willing to accept a 14-year-old girl into their home. She gave Echo the envelope, and Echo opened it and read the name inside it. She sobbed openly. The name read, Deanna May Cherbourg, Adoptive Parental Custodian. The approval date was nearly a year ago. Forgive me, child, said Mrs. Cherbourg worriedly, if I act presumptively on your part. I could see it coming in your mother all along. She's not a well woman, your mother. When you came to talk to me with your little talk, I knew a better thing I had never done. A year ago, Echo, I applied for open adoption. It was a long shot, and you weren't even one of the candidates at the time. You want to adopt me, Mrs. T? asked Echo. More than anything else in the world, said Mrs. Cherbourg. Outside, Bonnie embraced Gregory, and he knew that he had done the right thing in allowing Mrs. Cherbourg to adopt his daughter. Now he knew it was the right thing to do. Mrs. Cherbourg, asked Echo. You might call me Deanna if you wish, said Mrs. Cherbourg. Echo smiled and did her one better. Mama? Mrs. Cherbourg couldn't reply. She placed her hands to her lips and said nothing. Finally, she could speak again. Yes, she asked her softly. Mama, do you have a pen? Chapter 14 the man on the ladder didn't realize he had interrupted a phone call in progress. He unscrewed the wires like before and left them so he could screw them back together again, if he so decided. He then snatched down his ladder and placed it alongside the house, under the eaves and out of the snow. The man was the one Kaina would refer to as the captor. He didn't see Kaina as she peeked out the window upstairs. He wasn't yet thinking anyone else might be in the house. Brandy was a sharp girl, yet it puzzled him as to how she had managed to unhasp her door and get out to build fires in all the fireplaces. It puzzled him as to why she had built all of those fires. Kaina had been right about this man. The very minute she stopped thinking and looking for him, there he was. He had finally gotten home again, but he'd had to walk it. The snow was still a good six feet deep in a lot of places. He had managed to get home because he was one of the few people out here who understood the lay of the land. 